My name is Howard Dryden and I work with an international team in the Ghost Foundation. Our base is in the Roslyn Innovation Centre of Edinburgh University, but we work all over the world. The Ghost Foundation is part of the social enterprise Clean Water Wave, which has a mission to deliver clean drinking water for low income communities, especially island communities that are often water stressed. Up to 80% of human disease in these rural communities can be related to waterborne infection or by pollution or from water contaminated by heavy metals. We aim to try and support these communities by helping them with their water infrastructure. The Ghost Foundation is a CSR project of Clean Water Wave. But for now, I wish to focus on three aspects which include climate change and marine ecology. Now, carbon dioxide makes the ocean water more acidic, but we are now too late to stop the oceans reaching the acid tipping point. Even if the world went carbon neutral tomorrow, we will still lose all the whales, seals, birds and most of the fish. The second point is that all life on Earth depends upon nature and life underwater. The survival of humanity and society as we currently enjoy depends upon healthy oceans which we may potentially lose within the next 25 years. And the third point, we can regenerate nature in our oceans and reverse climate change. The solution is not the reduction of carbon dioxide, although that is important, but we have to eliminate all forms of chemical and plastic pollution from the air, the soil and the water over the next 10 years. I am a marine biologist and one of my main activities over the last 30 years has been in the provision of effluent treatment systems for some of the most polluting industries in the world, such as textiles in Bangladesh, petrochemicals and pharmaceuticals in China, to name but three. We have also designed and provided the water treatment and life support systems for over a hundred of the world's largest marine aquaria, such as Lisbon, Istanbul and the Dubai Mall. These are huge systems containing anything between 5,000 and 20,000 cubic metres of water with hundreds of species of fish and invertebrates. The water, you might be surprised to know, is usually artificial, even if they're next to the sea, because natural sea water contains too many toxic chemicals to risk using in the aquarium. Over the last 30 years, I became more aware of the climate change issues and the importance of our oceans in protecting life on Earth. Most of the attention surrounding climate change has been with renewable energy, or becoming net zero, or carbon mitigation strategies. However, this is not going to work, mainly because countries such as China that burn 50% of the world's coal reserves and contribute 30% to the atmospheric carbon are not going to slow down until at least 2030. A similar situation applies with India and South America. When you pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, some of it will dissolve through the surface of the oceans to make the water more acidic. Now we're getting a bit more technical. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, under RCP 8.5, which basically means business as usual, predict that oceanic pH that is, the acidity of the water will drop from pH 8.04, which we currently have, to a pH of 7.95 over the next 25 years. The IPCC also state that at a pH of 8.04, a form of calcium carbonate called aragonite will start to dissolve. This is important because more than 50% of all life forms in our oceans are made of aragonite. It would be like pouring lemon juice or vinegar onto the carbonate of soda. It starts to fizz, carbon dioxide is given off, then the calcium dissolves. The world is not going to become carbon neutral by the end of this decade. We are going to be emitting even more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than we are now. However, even if we were to become carbon neutral under RCP 4.5, oceanic pH would still drop to pH 7.95, but it might take five years longer, so 30 years as opposed to 25 years. Okay, why does this matter? 
Well, all life on Earth depends upon a healthy marine environment with lots of different types of animals and plants. Around 60% of all marine life is essentially invisible and is below half a millimetre in size. When the ocean acidity drops to pH 7.95, then it's not possible for many of these animals and plants to survive. You might well ask, how can such small animals and plants have any impact on the survival of humanity? This just seems ridiculous. Well, if we take one of the smallest organisms, a plant called Prochlorococcus, it is actually a bacteria with a green chlorophyll pigment to capture the energy from the sun. Well, there are more cells of this small plant than grains of sand on the planet. And in terms of the mass of plant material produced over the course of a year, Prochlorococcus produces seven times more than all of human agriculture combined. It also produces 20% of all our oxygen. The remarkable thing is that we didn't even know it existed until 1985. Most oceanographic ships use a plankton net of about 60 microns in size, that is 0.06 millimetres, mess size, and as such they simply miss catching this tiny plant. This also demonstrates our almost total lack of knowledge and understanding of the biological mechanisms happening under the waves. Moving up the food chain and to the animal kingdom, we come to the copepods. These are small insect-like creatures belonging to the group Crustacea. There are more than 5 billion tons of these small animals in our oceans, more than 10 times the biomass of all the animals on land put together. This is a really difficult number to visualise, so think of 17 million 747 jumbo jets, and if you laid them all nose to tail, they would go around the world 30 times. This is the mass of copepods in our oceans. Every night they migrate along with other animals in the plankton from a depth of 400 metres to the surface to feed on plants and small animals. This is the greatest mass migration on the planet by a huge margin. And the impact of this mass movement of animals actually moves more water than the moon and the tides. Yet it has not been factored into the climate change model. The other interesting fact is that these small copepods poop 30 times more carbon than man produces from the burning of fossil fuels. Around 6% of this poop reaches the abyss, where it is locked out of the carbon cycle. This is your real carbon bank, where 3 billion tonnes of carbon are deposited every year, which is around 50% of all the carbon produced from the burning of fossil fuels. When we look at the number of plants and animals in our oceans way back in the 1950s, we find that there were actually twice as many. This is really quite shocking because it means that if we had not lost all of these plants and animals, we wouldn't actually be experiencing climate change now, because all the carbon could have been locked out at 4,000 metres deep in the abyss. The next question is, well, why are the animals and plants in our oceans disappearing? It's not climate change, because an increase in carbon dioxide and temperature, coupled with nutrients, is actually plant food. We should be seeing an absolute explosion in plant growth, but we are seeing the reverse. Also, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere is dropping four times quicker than the carbon dioxide is increasing. This means that the drop in oxygen cannot be explained from the burning of fossil fuels. The only explanation is that we are losing plant life in the oceans. Again, I ask the question, but why is this happening if it's not climate change? Could it be the drop in pH? The answer is not yet. The oceanic pH is not low enough to impact on most of the plants. The only other remaining answer or most likely explanation is pollution. Pollution from toxic chemicals such as DDT, PCBs, fire retardants such as PBDE, TBT, organic paint, lead and mercury to name but a few. Many of these chemicals are oil-like and don't actually want to be in solution. They're referred to as hydrophobic, lipophilic chemicals and they tend to float on the surface of the water or form emulsions, or get absorbed onto hydrophobic 
water heating particles and get concentrated many thousands of times. Particles such as microplastics are perfect for absorbing and concentrating these most toxic of chemicals. We now know that the plastic and especially small micro and nanoparticles are in themselves toxic, especially to plants such as Prochlorococcus. Indeed, the plastic is toxic to just about every living organism, especially once it has absorbed a cocktail of toxic chemicals from the water. Given the almost complete lack of information in the literature, the GHOST team are collecting samples of plastic and plankton from our own research yacht, Copipod. Last year, we sailed Copipod from Scotland down to Lagos in Algarve, Portugal. We experienced some interesting weather, including a Force 10 going through the Bay of Biscay. But eventually the wind calmed and the dolphins came out to meet us. These were common dolphins. Unfortunately, more than 10,000 of these lovely animals are killed every year by the fishing industry round the Bay of Biscay. In the evening, the weather calmed and we were able to put the plankton net out to collect some samples of uh, microplastics and zooplankton. Using a very simple USB microscope at about 20 to 30 magnification, we're clearly able to see copepods, diatoms, but also a large amount of plastic fibers. Here we can see copepods darting around the screen in among plastic microfibers. 25% of all marine life in the oceans depend upon coral reefs as a nursery ground. I'm sure many of you have heard about coral bleaching. It is usually blamed on elevated temperatures due to climate change. We have now lost more than 50% of the world's coral reefs, and by the end of the decade it may be close to 90%. But it's not climate change killing the coral, it's pollution and disease. Corals are animals, but they have a symbiotic partner, a dinoflagellate plant that also lives inside the coral. Corals feed on particles, so they'll also be feeding on microplastic. And in many cases, the plastic will be carrying toxic chemicals such as oxybenzone. Oxybenzone is the active ingredient in sunblock. The chemical itself is not toxic, but when exposed to the sunlight, it generates hydroxyl radicals. And these radicals are like super strong chlorine bleach. You can imagine if this bleach was forming inside the coral, then they want to get rid of the chemical. So the coral dumps their coloured algae, symbiotic algae, and this is called coral bleaching. The coral is now seriously stressed, and any additional stressors, such as an elevated temperature or pathogenic bacteria, is usually enough to kill the coral. The following is a short video that gives a pretty good explanation of what's happening to the coral and the plankton and why it's so important to protect these organisms in the oceans. You can stop climate change. Chemicals in your personal care products pollute our rivers and oceans, causing runaway, unstoppable climate change. Stop using these products and help clean up our oceans. Clean ocean will absorb double the CO2 it does today, from 12 to 24 gigatons. Our oceans absorbed most of our CO2 emissions. Plankton, trillions of tiny drifting plants in our oceans. They use CO2 as food and produce 70% of our oxygen. They are the real lungs of our planet, just as important as trees. These tiny plants absorb more than 50% of our CO2 emissions. Plankton are the key to regulating our climate, but we have ignored their role. They are a crucial part of the climate change solution. Over the last 50 years, we have killed 50% of all plankton, and it continues to decline by 1% each year. The plankton 
are mainly being killed by toxic chemicals. Some of the worst killers are oxybenzone, oxynixate, octocrylene and parabens used in sunblock, used in dishwashing tablets, used in washing powder, used in lipsticks and in 3,500 other personal care products. Once in our oceans, these chemicals mix with microplastics and stick to them. When the plankton eat the microplastics, the toxic chemicals enter the plankton. Plankton then die in massive numbers. Oceans without plankton means losing our planet's main mechanism for absorbing CO2. That means game over for the climate and game over for humanity as we know it today. But in a clean ocean, plankton will recover super fast. A clean ocean is the most efficient way to fight climate change with minimal effort. Stop using products with oxybenzone, octanixate, octocrylene and parabens and check your personal care products. Check your cleaning products. Take the products back to the shop. It's killing our plankton. It's killing our oceans. It's killing our future. Throw our oceans a lifeline today, because in 10 years it will be too late. GOES, Global Oceanic Environmental Survey. This explains how chemicals absorbed onto plastic can be dangerous to coral reefs and coastal ecosystems, but what about the deep ocean? Surely the dilution factors are so great that no chemical could have an impact. If we stick with oxybenzone by way of example, there is about one teaspoonful of the chemical in a bottle of sunblock. This is sufficient to kill most plankton in a water volume equivalent to at least 10 Olympic-sized swimming pools. If you equate this to the world's oceans, it would take 70,000 tonnes to wipe out most of the marine life. The cosmetics industry manufacture between 20 and 30,000 tonnes of oxybenzone every year. It is used in about 3,500 different cosmetics, including sunblock. It is also used in UV filters for plastic, adhesives and in paint and the world makes more than 2 million tonnes of this chemical every year. So we make 2 million tonnes, but only 70,000 tonnes if it gets into the oceans wipes out all marine life. This is hard to believe, but it seems like a plausible explanation for the loss of 1% of all marine life every year that we are now witnessing. A recent survey of the Atlantic Ocean confirmed that there are around 7 particles of microplastic in every litre of water, from the surface down to a depth of 200 metres. Chemicals absorbed onto microplastics makes the combination very toxic to most life. Given that 1 in 15 of all living marine plants and animals now contain plastic, it is not surprising that marine life is crashing and that in 25 to 30 years, 80% will be gone. We are rapidly losing the life support system for the planet and this is the real reason why we are experiencing climate change and why carbon mitigation will not work. Marine plants use carbon dioxide as a carbon source but if the plants are disappearing then it allows the carbon dioxide to increase in the atmosphere as well as underwater. Carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid and this makes the water more acidic. When the pH drops to 7.95 over the next 25 years, most life underwater will simply dissolve. Given that all life on land depends upon healthy ocean ecosystems, the Ghost Foundation team consider this issue way more important than climate change. Indeed, the very survival of humanity will be at risk. I do not wish to appear alarmist or melodramatic, but this is simple chemistry and is the reality of the situation. So all your electric cars, renewable energy, windmills, while they are important in the whole scheme of things and for the survival of humanity, they are almost irrelevant. So what can we do? Well, if all life on Earth depends upon marine life in the oceans, we need to start regenerating nature 
and endeavour to repair the pollution damage in order to restore the health of the marine ecosystem. Indeed, we also need to do this on land, but by far the most important environment is life under the waves. Unfortunately, and because most of it is less than one millimetre in size, it is completely off the radar for most governments, industry and the public. In fact, most don't even know it exists. So how do you fix something that nobody knows is broken? Not an easy challenge. We know that pollution from toxic chemicals coupled with plastic are responsible for the dramatic loss of marine life. So if we're going to have any chance of regenerating nature, we need to eliminate toxic chemical pollution and substances such as plastic from entering the oceans. While this is a huge challenge, it is doable. Indeed, the cost of fixing this problem is probably less than the cost of COVID. We need complete water treatment of all industrial and municipal wastewater discharges everywhere. We also need to completely eliminate the discharge of stormwater into the oceans. We need to be zero impact or zero discharge. We also have to eliminate toxic chemicals and substances from being discharged into the atmosphere. We also need to stop using toxic forever chemicals, such as the ones that are designed to kill plants and animals, that's your herbicides and pesticides, because chemicals that are toxic to nature are also toxic to people. We need to make the world a toxic free planet by the end of the decade, or at least be well on the road to achieving its objective. This is critical because of the inertia of the marine ecosystem is such that it will take 10 years for the toxic chemicals and plastic to end up in the abyss. If this, is, if this task is not achieved, or if we allow the acidity of the oceans to drop below pH 7.95, then it's game over. This is the tipping point beyond which we cannot recover. If the world succeeds in the challenge and eliminates toxic chemicals and plastic, then nature will bounce back and it could do this really fast. It takes around 60 years for trees and plants on Earth to double their mass or weight. However, given that most life in the oceans are microscopic and some bacteria can double every 20 minutes, the average doubling time in the oceans is about three days. So if we take the toxic breaks off the marine ecosystem and eliminate pollution, then marine life can recover and remove most of the excess carbon from the burning of fossil fuels. But in reality, it is much more important to preserve and to protect the microscopic marine life because they represent the life support system and true lungs of our planet. Humanity depends upon nature. We have to understand and appreciate that nature also depends upon humanity. We need to look after nature in all its forms. And if we can do this by eliminating pollution over the next 10 years, we can restore the planet back to the toxic-free condition we had before the chemical revolution of the 1950s and mitigate the worst effects of climate change. Even if this is not the complete solution, it will definitely be a major part. And who could complain about restoring nature and living in a toxic-free world? I wish to finish off on a few of the key points. The first one is that we are too late to stop ocean acidification and the loss of most marine life. Humanity depends upon the oceans and all life in the oceans, so it's really important that we protect and nurture nature, especially the microscopic plankton that are the true lungs of the planet. You might be surprised to know that most municipal wastewater treatment systems don't actually remove toxic chemicals and plastic. So we need to upgrade all the systems in Europe and North America to zero impact status. 80% of the world has no effluent treatment, so we need to deal with that problem. We also need to eliminate pollution to the atmosphere and to the soil. And if we can do all this, then the oceans will regenerate. And this will happen really quickly, because the doubling time for biomass or for most life in the oceans is only three days. We can therefore restore marine life to a condition before the chemical revolution of the 1950s and as a secondary effect we stop climate change.